guys. Welcome to episode 24 of Tiger Heart Chats. It's so good to get in with you guys again. We've had a long break between this one and the last episode, but we're still getting so much amazing feedback. On average now, we're getting downloads of about a thousand now, which to me is super exciting because when we started, we were getting about 10 or 15. I've got someone special for you. This guy is someone that I've been trying to get on the show for ages. We've had a few technical difficulties the last few times we've tried to connect and this guy is super busy. So it's really really hard to lock him down. Please welcome to the stage, CEO of Juice, Jolion Bennett. <laughs> Woo, me. God, Jesus Christ. I, I, Whenever anyone does an intro to me, I'm like, where is this guy? When's he going to come out? When, when's gonna come out? Where, when is he? Like, uh, and it's, oh my God, it's me. Hi. Um, so, <laughs> so how hey. are you, buddy? I'm really, really good today. Thank you. I had a really chill day. I've, um, you're the first, um, you're the first human that I've actually talked to, um, uh, using my voice today. I've been like <laughs> completely, completely chilled out at home. I've, um, I had a long walk. I practiced a load of yoga. I've um, had a long meditate. I'm like really good. I'm like, awesome. I, I might be a bit too chilled for this. <laughs> no, it's all good. I, it's all good. I just get me breathing on this podcast. <laughs> just going, yeah, I'm all cool. <laughs> There's going to be people that listen to this podcast who don't know who you are. Give us a little introduction as to who you are and what you do. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm. You said my name in the posh way, by the way. So that makes you posh, like you, uh, <laughs> Jolion or Jolian. Jo- my name is Jolian Bennett. So I'm not posh, and I'm sorry. I'm the. Um, hey, you're all good. Um, you're obviously posh. You obviously went to a prep school and all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I like the way you're not denying that you did. Not that it's an accusation. So um, uh, I am the uh, CEO and the owner and the founder of uh, the consumer electronics brand uh, Juice. We are we make mobile phone um, accessories. We, I suppose, our biggest achievement today is we sell more iPhone cables than Apple. So we are um, we're a UK based business. We're in about thirty thousand shops. Uh, we. Um, we've won loads of awards and, um, and yeah, we're all just cracking on doing our do. So that's, that's, I suppose, who I am. Awesome. So you touched on what Juice is, but just tell us in depth about Juice, when it started and what you guys do. Okay. So I, um, I got fired in, uh, January, um, 2012. And it, it wasn't my first time of being fired. I've been fired so many times. And I, uh, you, you get to the point where you recognize the look on someone's face just before they're going to fire you. Wow. you almost seem to, they almost seem to walk differently, you know, like a little bit prowly or a little bit awkward. And so I got fired um, in uh, yeah January 2012, so nine years ago. And um, it was the third job on the trot I'd been fired from. And I was like, this time I'm going to start my own business. So I have always worked in mobile um, and I um, started, I looked at the mobile phone charging market and I was like, God, it's so boring. I want to do something a bit more design led, a bit more passion led, a bit more something with feeling. Um, And I came up with the concept while having breakfast one morning of juice, calling a a mobile phone brand juice. Um, We always say it, right? You run out of juice, you're, and I was, um, and I uh, had that kind of brainwave and then um, did the whole thing where I uh, went around banks asking for funding. They all said no. Um, then one bank manager gave me an opportunity. And, but he, um, there was like a kicker. He said I had to put my house on the line, which I did. Um, uh, and yeah, it was super intense. And I launched the business in August um, uh, 2012. And nine um, years later, you're an award-winning mobile phone. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, like that's, and it's weird, right? Like, so I, I don't feel any different about anything. Um, uh, but um, yeah, we, you know, we, um, as a business, everyone knows who we are in the industry. We're really well thought of. We're the market leaders. Um, uh, it's so peculiar when I meet people and they've got a juice accessory. I'm like, wow. wow. Yeah. I got a juice accessory. I made that up. <laughs> and um, and uh, I went through a phase in uh, like a few years ago of, of um, uh, when it started happening, when, we, when we'd sold millions and millions of units. And I started seeing the cables that I designed or the, 
the power banks I designed were people using them on trains, just in everyday normal civilian life. And I started, I, I went through a phase of going and talking to the people and realizing like it was such a weird thing to do. Going up to someone and say, hey, I, uh, I made that cable. And they're like, oh yeah, great. <laughs> All right. And like, it's always really awkward. <laughs> so now I just kind of look and smile. Um, but yeah. That's who Juice is. We are a brand that's about um, style, about design. We are the first design-led mobile accessories brand. If you think about all the boring stuff out there, um, boring plugs, boring cables, we brought color to um, the industry. We were the first ones to launch long cables because like, we've all lent out of bed, right? Trying to um, uh, plug our phone in while still looking at your social or whatever it would be. And so we were the first ones to actually... Uh, create long cables and we sell so many two meter and three meter cables right. um uh, the other brands are catching on to it now i'm going oh yeah why wouldn't why didn't we do that but um we're on to the next thing so in a like, i could talk for literally hours about who juice is but i guess that's it and no that's cool i'm very, um, very much me too in a in a, like a mobile phone accessory form so juice being the best-selling apple lightning cable in the market how does that make you feel um, like, I don't feel that much, if I'm honest. I'm a bit like, yeah, cool. I feel like, I like, and I'm not, not in an arrogant way in the slightest. It's kind of, um, uh, I kind of feel like that's great. Um, and then my brain instantly goes, but what could we do? What's next? Right. So I don't really, um, I don't really spend too much time celebrating because I'm always after the next thing because you know, Juice is the largest mobile accessories brand in the UK and in Ireland, but we're not in America. Mm. And so why aren't we number one in America? And so that's the, the that's my mental reaction. And um, uh, my um, my yoga coach is always telling me that I need to sit down and, and slow down and appreciate things a bit more. But God, life is short and let's get on with it, you know. <laughs> I, when did that happen? When were you highlighted as being that business? Um uh so it was a few years ago where we um overtook Apple and uh so um uh probably 2019 that's probably when we really um really started to make um make the progress that we needed. Right. I mean it all sounds it all sounds gravy, doesn't it? It all sounds absolutely lovely. And um, uh, whenever I'm talking about my business, I always um, want to tell the truth because at the start, it was grim. I was grim. I had my house on the line. I, um, I launched my business in August 2012 and no one cared. Literally no one cared. I spent most of the first um, two months uh, absolutely petrified that I was going to lose my house, um, making phone calls that no one would return. Like literally no one gave a monkeys about me and my idea and my brand and my, what I wanted to do. Come, uh, December, uh, Christmas, 2012, I'd lost half the money that I'd, um, borrowed. So I'd lost 50,000 pounds of the hundred thousand pounds that I had borrowed from the bank. And I was like, God, the people that were working alongside me were, um, one of the guys, um, said to me a few years ago, he said, I didn't think you were going to come back after Christmas. I thought that was you running away. <laughs> um, uh, um, <laughs> but there's no way. I never thought that. I, never, I, I, have, I have sometimes thought of running away, but at that time, I didn't think of um, running away. So yeah, hasn't all been gravy. It hasn't all been pleasant and nothing ever worthwhile ever is. It was just so grim at the start. I remember once that I drove home from... Um, this horrible warehouse, the worst warehouse ever. It was the only one I could afford. And I drove home all the way from Coventry to Oxford in silence. You know that like no music on in the car drive? Um, that feeling of like, oh my God, just listening to the road and just petrified that I was, I'd cocked it all up. I feel like those moments um, need to be discussed more than the like, yeah, we made it. Yeah. We won an award. Um, because at the end of the day, awards are just like, they're just awards, right? Also a lot of people that set up in the startup space generally, and I mean this with respect, are just looking for the reward as opposed to focusing on how do you get to that reward and how do you enjoy that journey towards that reward? And sometimes when you focus on the reward too much, you don't actually achieve anything. I mean, uh, like if a, a business award is just ego. 
and it can be good for um, PR and it can be good for like saying, yeah, I'm a, you know, I, um, and it's really, it's quite awkward because um, when I, and when my business wins awards, like we, I feel like we probably should try and be a bit more gassed about it. Um, but like, it's just an award and it's just in a judge and it's not the thing, you know, the thing is actually doing positive things and um, being an amazing business, being a positive, um, successful thing. Like, mm-hmm. and, and I'm sure that um, there's so many businesses out there in the world that um, have never got an award and, and, um, and they are incredible and they deserve all the awards. So I think, I, and also if you've got a good PR agency, you get awards. I sound so ungrateful and, I'm, I, and I don't mean to sound that way. I just, um, hey, you know what? We, we, re- we removed all plastic from all of our packaging um, uh, the middle of last year, the middle of the year before, sorry. And that, that's something to be gassed about. You know, we were putting a million pieces of single-use plastic into landfill every year, and now we're putting zero million, like zero. So let's talk about Juice's packaging, because that's something that was highlighted in your press release. What is it that you guys are doing different with your packaging? Um, Loads of stuff. Like when you're buying a product, you're buying packaging. Look at the way... um, all of the um, big consumer electronics brands do it. The really good ones like Apple, like they make their packaging an experience. So we try and use our packaging in order to sell the product. So you'll see um, that, um, you know, like we do plugs, part of our initial brand, which everyone's been trying to kill ever since was um, putting a plug into a carton. So my whole do, my whole, my whole deal was, right, I'm going to create this brand called Juice. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm, I might as well put it in like a, like a juice carton. And I had a designer design that up for me. And then I was like, okay, I, need, I like it's really boring and white or black. Why don't I make it a color? And then I was like, okay, well, like color, people buy um, what color would they associate with Apple? What um, color would they associate with Blackberry? Because Blackberry was a thing back then. And yeah. um, so Apple was green. And then I was like, okay. And then, and then I all of a sudden started presenting a product that was – a plug in a green carton and calling it apple juice. And it was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then, and then I did one in a purple carton and I called it blackberry juice. And, um, and like, that was the start. That was the whole thing. So our packaging and our design of our packaging, like a plug is a plug is a plug is a plug, but um, like we do nice plugs and um, that are really good quality that have got a design edge to them. And um so we had a board meeting like two and a half years ago and we were sitting there looking at our packaging and our cables were selling really, really well. Everything was, everything was going really well. And um, we basically um, had some calculations done by um, one of our team uh, who said, do you realize that we're putting like 1,175,000 pieces of single-use plastic um, into the market and do you realize that's all going into landfill it's non-recyclable and do you realize we're, we're doing that year after year and do you think we should be doing that and this is um, just when people were starting to get a bit more aware of packaging and and the impact yeah and like a bit, you know back to awards there should be um, the opposite of awards for businesses that are doing that. I was so ashamed. It was so grim. And um, that was the point when we started the project of uh, removing all single-use plastic from all of our packaging. And it's so hard to do it, so hard to um, to go out and find the, the people in China that, that understand why you would want to do that. Right. Uh, but um, we, we managed to do it the middle of 2019, and um, it was super cool. Uh, but my, I had to, I had to sign it off myself. My, my board of directors were sitting there going, "Like you're crazy. Why are we, <laughs> why are we going to be spending um, three hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year more on packaging to make it um, made from post consumer waste and completely recyclable?" Um, and everyone voted against it. And I had to, at the end of the day, um, play my equity card and say, well, actually, I own the business, so we're going to do that. And um, 
And do you know, one thing that I've learned from that process is we, we launched the business, launched the packaging out into the market in summer 2019. And we gained 4% market share, which is ginormous between summer and Christmas. And we did that because consumers bought more of our products because they could see that it was made. We advertised it and it was on the packaging that it was made from post-consumer waste to the stuff you put in your recycling bin. And it was absolutely fully recyclable. And that, that extra cost was well um, paid back. And yeah. then um, um, because consumers do care, they do. And can, like, it, it was really a heartening time for us to see, do you know what? Do the right thing. Give the consumers a positive choice to make and they will make it. And um, yeah, and we've been banging on about our, um, our single reduction, well, removal of single use plastic ever since. But um, that's something that we should um, be proud of. That's a fantastic story. I mean, Four percent increase in yeah, selling right. the product is, is just massive. How did you feel when you were in that scenario where you were trying to push this great idea to your board of directors and they weren't buying into it? Um, like it's, I don't know. I felt a bit um, it's annoying. Um, uh, but I totally understood their point of view. I totally got it. Like these people that are really, my directors are so talented and they're sitting there going, well, actually, look, we're a business. We're about making the most profit we possibly can. Um, uh, we have got this great range. Why are we going to change that um, and lose all of this money? And um, the truth is, uh, you know, the truth is it was, a, it was a big risk and sensible directors who didn't own the business um, were right to sit there and go, don't take that risk. And I, one of the reasons that I got fired so much and one of the reasons that I had to start my own business is because I don't want people telling me what to do. I've never wanted anyone to tell me what to do. You know, I'm fiercely independent. I want to have my, um, my liberty is more important to me um, uh, than anything else. So uh, I understood and I just didn't care. And we were just going to crack on. So that's what I had to say. Actually, I've got 100% of the shares and 100% shareholder says we're going to do this. So we're going to do it. <laughs> and then how did you feel afterwards, you know, with this fantastic I felt happy. I felt, I felt so happy that, but happy because um, it showed to me. And again and again, and I see this so many times and, and so often in, in life and in society that people are generally so good. The world is full of good, kind humans that want mm. to do the right thing. And we all get saturated by this news of like a murderer or a robber or whatever it would be. They all, they all get highlighted when actually the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of the people on this planet want to do the right thing. They want to make the right choice. They want to be positive. They're, um, they're gentle souls just going about their, their business. And I, um, uh, I was heartened to see that um, uh, you know, we did the right thing and then the right thing happened. And, um, yeah, it's really good. I, so I just felt really, I didn't feel any sort of, um, smugness. I just felt like, God, that's heartened by the fact that people, if you do the right thing, they won't let you down. And, yeah. um, and they didn't. And, you know, I sound like, I sound like I'm about to launch into a song or, or, or I'm in <laughs> with dreams, but like, like seriously, it was so cool. And, and yeah, that and that trend has continued. You know, juice has continued over the last eighteen months to to grow and to prosper. We're having, we are coming to the end of um, come to the end of Q one, and we've had the best Q one we've ever had. And now Amazing. we're coming into Q two, and we're having the best Q two we've ever had. Like the business is incredibly brisk, and um, yeah, and I'm all I'll always be grateful for to the consumers that buy our brand. Just touching on the packaging aspect of juice, you wanted to create a product that's created from things that people put into their recyclable bins and is something that people could recycle in the future. You were looking for a manufacturer in China to build that for you. You mentioned that you struggled a little bit to try and find that right partner. So how did you do that? What is the process of you going with an idea to China and finding the right partner to build that idea that you have? Um, so, um, the, so the first part of your question was, yeah, it was, it was really hard to do it. And why was it so hard? It was, it was hard because 
if you go to South China, to Dongguan and Shenzhen, which is where 90% of the consumer electronics um, in the world is made, it's a space that's um, three times the size of the UK in its entirety, and it's just an industrial zone. So imagine factories after factories after factories, as far as you can see, um, uh, tens of millions of workers all working in these factories. And you go there and you say, I want you to use a material that's going to cost more money to make and is going to be harder to work with, um, which is going to slow down production, which is going to, um, uh, you know, all of these negative things that, that the manufacturing industry in South China is trying to speed everything up, make everything cheaper. And it's completely counterintuitive. So... Um, I understand the reticence of the Chinese factories when they were um, sitting there going, why, why would you want to pay more money, have less output, um, you know, all of this stuff. Um, and how did we find our partner? Well, it's just like so much in business and in life, it's just about being belligerent and never stopping, you know, just right. keep going. So we had to go through uh, probably 15 to 20 factories um, before we found a factory called Clearfold, um, who, um, who could give us the, um, the uh, material that we needed in the volumes that we needed. You know, whenever you're, whenever you're do if you're going to make something out of recycled plastic and you're going to make a thousand of them, it's kind of a bit easier than saying, I'm going to make 2 million um, a year um, because you need that supply of plastic. You need that supply of um, usable recycled plastic. And then to be able to make it recyclable again, you need to change all the inks you're using and change all of the um, uh, the way that you're making it have no. So it just, it feels like it's really, really simple. And it's so not, it has so many hurdles. But as I say, we've been doing it for 18 months and um, there should be an award for businesses that are reducing their impact um, on society, on on the uh, on the on the globe, rather than an award for um, highest turnover or best profit, it's like me. All right, great, you've made five hundred million dollars, but um, you've ruined a, a corner of the ocean. Like no, like um, you took you you made no money, and you took all the plastic out of the ocean and and made um, homes out of it. Like give that guy an award, and. Um, so I think awards should be based more on achievements like that. Absolutely. And just with regards to you going out to China and developing these relationships, so you mentioned the company Clearfold. Had you worked with them before? No. So no, never before. Wow. And one of my one of my rules is that I I personally visit all the factories that we are going to trade with. And I do that for loads of different reasons. I like to go and meet the owner. I like to go and look around. I like to go and you know, just go and suss it out and um, check out what's going on. Um, but and I, the main reason I do it is because I like to go and have a look at where the workers um, are living and what kind of an environment that factory is providing. It's so important when you're buying in, in uh, China because we're pushing for price. We want the best price possible, but we want it to be ethically sourced as well. So um, you know, I've seen some terrible things and people don't, people don't talk about it so much anymore. People just assume that everything manufacturing all over the planet is to a certain standard. And I never assume that. So, um, I go and I have a look and, um, with every factory and like I did with Clearfold, um, other packaging factories could have done them, um, scale of the material provided the scale of the material and also, um, but the the way their workers were living and the canteens and the dormitories and the it was just so grim. There were some really dodgy places. So right, um, yeah. Um, getting an ethically sourced um, product is really important to me. I think you need to be positive throughout your whole supply chain. And as much as I hate going to um, industrial zones wherever they are. Um, uh, I think it's important that the owner of the business, if he's going to be spending his money and it's his brand and it's um, uh, that's going to be something that I own, then I'm going to go and have a look at it. And anyone that's involved in the process of making one of my products to selling one of my products, then I want to make sure they're treated fairly and it's all 
um, above board, you know? And it's also about relationships, you know, like the key to any business is to converse with other businesses and work together. And the only way you can truly understand these partners that you're creating relationships with is to understand them. And you have to go out and just shake hands, you know, it's important. Yeah, of course. And um, like, yeah, of course, uh, building those relationships is so interesting. Um, culturally, when you're doing business internationally, like the, the the way we are in the UK, we're so old fashioned and backward in so many ways. And the way we do things, like we're we're considered. I, I mean, when you really um, a big thing in China is that uh, you're um, you're expected to consume the um, uh, the food and drinks that are offered to you when you're. Um, going out, and if you were to shun them, then it would be seen as um, uh, an insult. And so, I've I've been in deepest, darkest China before, um, uh, and had some very peculiar experiences, and not really knowing what I'm doing, and eating some really weird stuff that's perfectly normal to them culturally. But like, um, yeah, it's really um, I'm and I'm. There was one incident where. Uh, I can't stand whiskey, right? I hate it. And <laughs> worse than that, whiskey, um, like it does on many people, makes me really punchy and really, <laughs> really, really drunk. And like, so uh, uh, super bullish, like, um, super um, pumped up. So this guy I was, I was dealing with, and I still deal with him, uh, at the end of a meal, pulled out a bottle of Johnny Walker, like black label. And I was like, oh God. And he opened it and that, that, and he poured himself like a ginormous glass, a mere ginormous glass. And we drank um, the, like I was struggled through the whole bottle and we drank the whole bottle. And at the end of it, I was just absolutely, absolutely hammered. And there I am. And my business is, um, because of the time difference, my business has started waking up and, you know, everyone's emailing me and talking to me about stuff. And I'm like, God, I can't, I'm not, I'm not responsible enough to deal with anything today. <laughs> and, and then, and then um, this guy <laughs> says, did you enjoy that? And I lay it because I'm so drunk. I lay it on really thick. I was like, that was wonderful. The best whiskey ever. Like brilliant. <laughs> and like, um, he snaps his fingers and the waiter brings over another one that he opens up. <laughs> so, so we start drinking that one. And, and I, good to my, good to my word i believe that um we finished the second bottle and i I woke up sometime later um in my hotel room a bit dehydrated but yeah um uh, I can't even remember what we were talking about, but culture. <laughs> cultural relationships. Myself, I, you know, I worked with lots of different businesses around the world, China, the US, like all over Europe. And yes, there are differences in the way people conduct themselves in a business space in the other side of the world. And I mean that in a positive way. And you talk about whiskey. I mean, yeah, whiskey is a big thing in China. Huge thing, yeah. But sometimes it's good to explore and engage with people when they're doing things that aren't really right for you like you know you mentioned that you don't like whiskey but you still tried it you still have this yeah, experience course. this this bonding of moment of course and um it's just it's really interesting how um another big difference i find in china is that in in the uk we do small talk first right we're like hey how's it going nice to see you john nice yeah oh yeah how's wendy yeah everything's okay great yeah thanks <laughs> thanks so much um like we do all of the small talk and then we get down to business and then we finish with a small amount of small talk. So I didn't even notice that we did that. Um, but that's how we roll um, in the UK. In China, they do it exactly the opposite way around, where there's very little small talk, business first, like nail the business. Um, and then you go full into small talk. So it's like the opposite <laughs> way around. Um, uh, and then uh, business in America is there's just no small talk. It's just all aggression and ego. And, uh, <laughs> uh, like, uh, my, my least favorite country to do business in, I'm afraid. Um, but, um, yeah. So culturally it's, it's been, um, fascinating for me because I'd never been to China before starting my business. So it's been a really interesting learning curve. I love China. I mean, I've been out there a few times. If you're looking for more stories from inspirational entrepreneurs, check out the serial entrepreneur from startups magazine, a print and digital publication that champions tech startups. Here, their editor, 
Anna Flocker interviews the most innovative startups of the moment with some startup lessons and failure fables, as well as a sprinkling of inspirational advice. You can find them by searching The Serial Entrepreneur into any streaming service or by going to startupsmagazine.co.uk. Now back to the show. So let's talk a little bit about your past. Where are you from? I'm from Oxford. So I'm, I was born in, um, in Oxford um, and I lived, I grew up just outside Oxford in a sleepy little Oxfordshire village where um, I lived, I had the most wonderful childhood. I lived um, in the same house um, for 20 odd years in the same village. Um, I uh, went to the village primary school, really small place. And I've still got um, lots of very close friends that live there, a little village called Stand Lake. And we, um, you know, our summers were filled with um, uh, um, uh, running around um, by the lake, smoking dope and drinking um, beer and like having a <laughs> lovely time. Um, and um, uh, I then I went off to university um, in 1998 um, just in the middle of that, well, towards the like hiatus of the rave scene, and I and I absolutely loved that. I loved clubbing. I loved the whole um, free parties. I loved the um, that whole movement. And um, so I obviously went to university in Brighton because that was the epicenter of um, where um, uh, club life was happening. So. And it was a big shock to the system from going from being in a sleepy Oxfordshire village um, to being in the middle of Brighton, where clubs stayed open till like eight in the morning. It was madness. <laughs> what did you study at Brighton? Um, so I've always loved sport. So I, I wanted to do a degree that had something to do with sport. I didn't want to be a PE teacher. So I chose sports science, which is psychology, sociology, biomechanics, and physiology um, in application to sport. So basically it means all of those disciplines um, related to um, sport, I'm, I'm, if I'm honest, I didn't do a lot of work. I just had a really good time going out and having a wonderful time with all my mates. Brighton's a great city to have a good time in, definitely. Oh my god, it's so good! Like I, I went back recently, and it um, it's still got that vibe. You know, Brighton always. And I think it's because of the massive gay scene that is a little bit more. Um, liberal, a bit more open. Um, but yeah, I used to love it. I used to go to this club called the Zap Club um, in Brighton, which was tiny and like sweaty. And just, I used to go um, and um, to these mad nights. I absolutely loved it. And I'm sure um, from the rave generation, from that, um, that, all those smiley faces that I used to see, I'm sure Juice. <laughs> was born slightly the color and the vibrancy of the brand came from uh like some uh crazy night sitting on brighton beach at like 10 in the morning so yeah <laughs> yeah i love that so how did you get into the line of work that you're into now i mean you touched on where you studied what you studied and also you touched on being fired a load of times where was the transition so my you? life sounds a bit like a rom-com doesn't it like so i <laughs> um i went back to um, I went back to my um, hometown, Stanlake, when I totally ran out of money in Brighton. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and sorry, I'd finished university in 98. I started it in 95. But 1998, I came home and I was like, um, uh, I'm so broke. And I, I had a summer job working at the local pub. I was a barman at the local pub. And so I went to um, the landlord and landlady of the local pub and said, hey, I'm, like, I'm, I'm back. I'll be a barman again. And I started being a barman that end of that summer um, in 1998. And then all of the locals I got to know, and I was always so impressed, um, stupidly, and, um, but always so impressed by the businessmen coming in with their big cars and their wadges of money, ordering pints of Stella and being like these alpha guys. I was like, wow, <laughs> guys are like, they're so cool. And then one of the said alpha guys um, uh, came in one day and was like, looked really down in the dumps and was like, oh God, I've had the worst day. Um, my sales manager has just walked out. I've got to replace him. What am I going to do? He just, 
He just walked out. And I instantly said, look no further. Like, I am absolutely ready to be your sales manager. I'm your main man. Let's go. And so um, I got my first job uh, from that, like, big hitter in the mobile phone um, game. Right. Uh, which was still very, very um, small at the time. Um, I got my first break with him and I started... Um, uh, I started as a sales, well, as, as a team leader, they, they didn't give me the, um, sales manager job. They gave me the team leader job and I, um, cause I wasn't quite up to it. And, um, yeah, I started that at the end of 1990, um, 1998. And I remember I had a briefcase and, um, the only thing I ever put in that briefcase was the sandwiches that my mum made. <laughs> and, um, I used to go and, and sit and be this business guy. Yeah. That's, that's how it all started. So that company was working within the mobile space. Is that how you started to develop this business sense of that industry? Totally. So I worked for a guy called Angus Dorr, um, who um, was probably the biggest influence on me in my early career. And he was a, just a really, really, really smart businessman, um, had all of the angles. And so I worked with him for uh, eight years. And I worked as his number two while he built a business that um, uh, went from zero to 130 million turnover in six years. Whoa, okay. Um, and so he was a super. And then um, uh, he celebrated far too hard um, uh, with all, all of the sports cars, all of the um, dancing girls and all of the things that um, in the 90s were considered cool. Um, and, um, uh, his business went bust. So I, oh, I'm sorry. Watched that, I watched that happen and it was really, I think, I think that probably was the biggest lesson that I could have got in business. Um, is that, um, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And, um, so don't celebrate too early, you know, like, um, keep your eye on your cash flow always. <laughs> Just with regards to businesses that face challenges, what challenges does juice face in the next few years? Um, uh, like every business, you need to keep yourself new, right? So, um, we need to keep finding the next new thing. And I, I say that, um, that's the only thing that I can think of as a challenge. So I don't see that we've got too many challenges as long as we work hard, push forward, um, and work that little bit harder than, um, our competitors. I mean, juice is an established brand now, you know, people know our products. Um, and so it's about, uh, developing and evolving, staying the same. If you stay the same, then you just end up um, behind your competitors because they're moving forward. So um, our biggest challenge is going to be innovating and, and doing new things. But we've got so many new things coming that I just like, we're all good. <laughs> You're heavily into wellness. What practices do you do each day to ensure your mind and body are in the right form for what you need to do? Mm, it's interesting, right? So um, I used to drink loads of wine in order to um, unwind and it, and it works to a degree. Um, uh, but uh, I, like three and a half years ago, I discovered uh, yoga and uh, so vinyasa flow yoga. And um, I uh, had, I have um, uh, a yoga coach called uh, Molly Evie, um, Molly Evie Morris. Um, and she, uh, has taught me all different aspects of yoga and meditation and pranayama. So I am totally obsessed with, um, with yoga and I practice yoga, um, uh, most days. And, uh, if I don't practice yoga, then I will practice um, meditation or, um, and it's so difficult because I, 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 I talk about this to my friends who are, um, my old uni friends and my old village friends and lots of my friends that have never done yoga. And it's, um, the, the preconception around yoga is really bendy, skinny, hot girls, um, doing the splits all together in a snooty kind of way. And as a guy, you look at that and go, oh my God, it's so intimidating. I don't want to have anything to do with it. When the reality is real yoga um, and good yoga, it's got nothing to do with anyone else. It's to do with you. And it's about quieting your mind and quietening your, um, the voice that's banging on in your head and being able to find your center and all of the movement, all of um, 
uh, the breathing, all of the techniques, all they're trying to do is give you a taste of complete and utter peace. And um, I get that from yoga now. And you need to learn the techniques, you need to learn the poses, you need to keep doing them all. Um, and then you get to a point where you can totally quiet in your mind. I mean, how nice is that, right? Just have total silence in there and just be connected to who you really are. So yeah. um, uh, yoga and meditation is so important for me. I'm, uh, and I wouldn't say that I do them in order to um, to deal with stress. I do them because I love them. And, and um, yeah, they keep me centered. They keep me um, able to cope with running biz my business, able to cope with everything you do in your life. If you give yourself that time every day, and it can be 15 minutes or it can be an hour. Or like today, I had yoga class from uh, 12 to 1, and then I meditated from um, uh, 1 to 1.30. And it was so nice, like, just such a great way uh, to spend some time. So Absolutely. I always, I always, I'm a massive fan of yoga. I'm a massive fan of yoga for improvement as well. So, in terms of if someone wants to be really good at business, then I um I prescribe yoga. Uh, some of the best decisions I've made in my business have come from uh, from the practice of yoga and post meditation and the, the thoughts that occur and the quietness and creativity too. So, um, yeah, yoga and a good walk. I like I live on a, I live on a nature reserve, so I get out and for a walk every every day. Go for a, a walk around the nature reserve, which is beautiful. Nice. Do you feel that your life has dramatically changed since you've started to incorporate wellness into your daily routine? Hugely, 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 like massively. Um, and it's actually it's more of a case of that I would say that I'm I am living a lot more now. I'm a lot more aware, a lot more happy. And um, I, I mean, you know, I have, I have been so lucky. I got a really good yoga coach and, um, uh, and Molly is like incredible. Her knowledge for someone that's young um, is just so wide. Um, and so, yeah, you know, my genuinely, the best decisions I've made in my business have come from the quietness that yoga and meditation and pranayama has um, given me. Pranayama is the breathing. So just breathing in a certain way, you know, breathing in um, for six, um, holding for three, breathing out for six, like just simple breathing techniques that can change the actual way your brain is working and how you feel. Like, who knew that? I didn't know that. And yeah. so... Um, like the, the body and the mind, um, is magical. And Absolutely. so, um, yeah, I, I am like, if like practice some yoga, I mean, if I could give advice to anyone about anything, like go and practice some yoga and get to know yourself and get to know what you are and who you are. And then, um, and don't worry about all of that. Like I could not, I, some people say when they start yoga, they couldn't touch their toes. I couldn't touch my knees. But I was like, <laughs> I was the stiffest guy ever. And, um, and, uh, like, don't worry about all of that. There's no ego in yoga. You're just where you are. And, um, uh, my yoga coach always says to me that she's jealous, um, that I'm not, I'm not as bendy as her. She wants to go back so she can do all of the practice of um, becoming more bendy and finding those edges. You know, she searches for that now. Whereas um, uh, where she sees me struggling, she's actually jealous. She wants to be able to, she wants to be able to struggle as well, which is like a bit weird, but that's more yoga than someone sniggering at you. Like let that go. So on the flip side of you having this positive mindset that you've explored and you're still exploring what frustrates you at the moment um uh so like the the way um in the whole world i suppose is a big question but i think that the way that um people are consuming media is just really stupid and um i think that um when i look at um, the leaders of the free world aren't politicians in any way. They're the people that own large um, corporations like Facebook or like Instagram. Well, Instagram and Facebook are owned by the same firm, right? Uh, yeah. And um, and then you've got Twitter and you now you've got TikTok. You've got all these these um, social media businesses that p 
people are, I mean, it's made up. It's not real. Like people don't look like that. People don't do that stuff. Um, uh, and so we're kind of, the thing that would frustrate me most is the way that people are linking, um, mixing reality with um, social media. And when social media is a lie, I talk to my daughters about it saying like, you know, social media is made up land. It's like a comic. Like don't, and it's okay for you to look at Instagram and laugh at the the reels and whatever else you're doing, but don't judge your stomach on that girl's stomach. Um, uh, because that girl's stomach is not like that. That's made up. That's got a filter in it. That's whatever it would be. And so um, I suppose my frustration and disappointment in the planet at the moment is we're all um, getting our input from a source that's false. And um, and the reality is that um, without banging on about yoga too much, the, the um, connecting to yourself will, will give you a lot more truth than connecting to a made up world in social media. I got hacked last June and I used to be quite prolific on social media. But I did find that it did start to affect my mentality. I still use social media, but I use it very lightly now. And I feel so much better for it. It's been like about nine months now since I started getting back onto social media and just taking it one step at a time. There's so many distractions on it, which can destroy your humanity. Yeah, it's so weird. And like, when did it become important? How many people like a picture? Yeah. Or how quickly they like a picture. Like, no, like just let that go. Go and um look at the sky. Go and um, hey, trees are real. Like, go and look at a tree. Um, and like that's you're gonna get more out of that than you are from uh from following someone who's um commercializing their social media. Like, and don't get me wrong, we know we use social media. It's a challenge for me because I look at it and kind of go, um, I don't want to fuel that fire so we never spend money on social we never advertise and push things out on social because i don't really want um i don't really want to do that i feel like it's a negative thing in the world and and um it's only negative because it's been used by um business in order to um manipulate a market like card is so dark there's dark forces and that's why every day when i go out for my walk i'm like forget all electronics let me like walk along and look at the sky and feel the wind and um that's where we all should be that's where we all come from being outside and there should be more of that there should be more um you know, I think all, all children should be taught to go and walk outside, stay away from screens, mm. you know, go and go and hang out with their mates. But yeah, so interesting, right? The world has changed a lot. I do feel, though, the new generation, the younger generation, the generation wise are a bit more cautious about social media. I think that they're the saviors of the world, by the way. Yes. Like when I look at my when I look at my um uh, my 21 year old, um, uh, niece and goddaughter Libby, I look at her and I'm like, so you don't eat meat, you exercise all the time. You think social media is a load of rubbish. You, um, you want a decentralized government. You like, you, you believe in um, the law of attraction. You believe in positivity, you like, and it's all, that's just all normal for you. Um, and you know, why would you want to create more waste? You know, why would you, I, I look at, I look at, um, her and her generation and, and, you know, my nephew Harley, and I look at them and I'm kind of going, do you know what guys, like you are going to save this planet. Um, <laughs> and then I, and then I look at my, at my parents, um, who obviously, you know, they don't know any different, but they, <laughs> they think they, I, I don't know they um, it was, um, I feel like my generation, so I'm 45 now, my generation have been the ones going, hey, this is terrible. This is terrible. This is like, everything's going wrong. We've got to start doing something about it. And we've kind of started doing something about it. Um, and yeah, I've got loads of hope for the next generation, the ones coming through. Um, Same here. Absolutely. And so um, I'm feeling like, come on, guys, you can do this. You can do this. <laughs> We're coming towards the end of this discussion. It just feels like it's just gone so quickly, which is amazing. Two more questions. This first one, which I hope you can really reflect on. What advice would you give yourself if you were to meet a younger version of you that's just starting to become a professional? So interesting, you know, because um, I would... Um, 
I would probably say don't listen to them. Um, uh, because, and, and like trust your gut, that you know what you're doing, back yourself. I had so many wobbles throughout my career where I, um, I had to, um, you know, like listen to my boss and do something that I didn't think was the right thing, be in negative cultures, be in environments where I felt like it was wrong. And um, uh, I think I would like to go back to myself and say, hey, don't listen to them. You've got this. Like, I'd like to go and give them, put an arm around my shoulder and say, come on, you can do this. Like, you're all good. And I think everyone needs that. But I could have really done with that from me when I was starting out in business because um, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the mistakes I made was because I've gone against what I believe is right and I believe is true. And um, the joy of owning your own organization is that you don't have to listen to anyone else. So um, uh, while I employ really clever people that tell me what they think, at the end of the day, if I want to go and do something like change all my packaging, then I can go and do that. And uh, sure, there's lots of tough things with owning your own business, but that's a total joy for me. I think that's what I would do. That liberation of running your own thing and making your own decisions and making your own mistakes is such a wonderful thing that everyone should experience. Yeah, totally. I um, I um, I hope that my daughters, um, if they want to go and do it, do exactly that. And, you know, they have the joy of um, losing money and then making it back and falling over and scraping themselves up and, and doing all of that do because it is a joy and it is a process. And you're right at the very top of this conversation, you said um, that it's about the journey, you know, about the, the going through the process and learning. And um, I wouldn't want to take that away from them. So, yeah. <laughs> We've come to the end of the discussion. Again, it's been amazing. You've got a wonderful energy about you. Like everything you say is really inspiring. Um, hey, thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs> it's awesome. And I'm sure lots of people listening to this will get a lot of value out of it. If anyone wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, so uh, you can contact me through my mail. I'm, uh, like my mail is really simple, joe at juice.co.uk. And um, I get a zillion mails, um, but um, drop me a mail if you want to ask me anything or um, you want to suggest something or you just want to say, hey, then like that's all good, you know. Like, mm-hmm. I, um, I don't mind getting emails and this whole, this whole world is about connecting. So um, uh, any comments or anything to say, joe at juice.co.uk and um, I read them all. I'll get to them all. It might take me a while, so just be patient. Joe, you've been amazing. You've absolutely been amazing. Thank you so much hey, for your time. Thanks, thanks Ange. We kept missing each other, but I'm so glad we finally connected. You've basically made my afternoon now. So I'm just gonna <laughs> Hey, that's so kind. Thanks so much. <laughs> Those of you listening, thanks so much for investing your time and listening to this podcast. We really, really appreciate all the comments we're getting through. If you want to share anything, again, don't forget the hashtag Tiger Heart Chats, all one word. Whatever you are, whatever you're doing, please be good.